Okay, uh, welcome to lecture six. And uh, actually, we would like to change the title of lecture six because we have a very creative idea, and uh, we have uh, foreign um, speakers from uh, Venezuela, Brazil, and Japan. So um, uh, the title has been changed to People's Resistance and Mobilization to Tackle Community and Environmental Challenges. And our first speaker is uh, Dr. Rebecca Johnson. She is the uh, co-founder uh, co of ICANN, and also uh, Ms. Harara uh, Hiroko from Japan Perspective News, and also uh, Fujio Koka uh, Imiko from uh, Fukushima Beacon for Global Citizen Network. And also we have two guest speakers from Brazil, from uh, Brazilian uh, Landless Worker Movement, MST, and also we have uh, friends, uh, Nan Rathas, uh, from um, the Elba, and uh, two uh, Brazilian uh, friends is um, Anna Deha Hers and also Aliti uh, Pivat. Thank you very much. And then first, um, Doctor Rebecca Johnson. And then we have her, her name. Oh. Yes, yeah. I'm already. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, yes. <clears throat> so. You know the song I sang at the end of the last thing? Well, our interpreters found this song uh, on the web from a recording made uh, and published in 2008. And I just thought, when it was played to me, I thought we would just start with this because it shows the interconnectedness uh, and how things happen. So whenever you're ready to play this, and if you want to sing with it too, it they choose a different, a slightly different tune from mine, and slightly different words. But mine itself came from, as I said, the the ancestors, the First Nation, the indigenous people of the Americas, and we sang it a lot at Greenham, and it's been sung in so many, particularly women's protests. Um, so when they played it to me, I, I, wasn't, I, I didn't know of it, I'd never heard it before like this, but I also wasn't surprised. And I want to, them to play it for you too because I think it's just a wonderful example and do feel like you can sing along a little bit if, as, as it's, because they repeat it again quite a few times. It was played beautifully before. Hey, I'm no 
for playing that and thank you thank you to the interpreters for finding it so isn't it amazing isn't it that you know we can we can pass our songs and we can pass our ideas we can share and learn that is exactly what I've been trying to, to, to talk about in, in, in this lecture series and so this last se section, I'm really glad that it was agreed that we could change the structure for this section <clears throat> um, and actually hear directly and share directly with the different participants here from different countries and different movements. Because what, when we think about people's resistance and mobilizations, what do you imagine? So I'm going to just introduce this with some thinking about this because <clears throat> I think of civil society, I think of civil society actions and groupings and they can be large or they can be small. They may be formally constituted as NGOs, as non-governmental organizations or more informal organic, movement-based, grassroots, kusanane, we got immobilizations. And, but the traditional within the, N, uh, within the UN context was to call them non-governmental organizations by contrast with the governments, so the NGOs. And these can also be small or medium-sized or large. They can be local. They can be regional in terms of a small number, groups of towns, or groups of schools sometimes even, or they can be national. They can be a wider regional, the groupings among a number of countries from a particular geographical region. NGOs often make those connections from the Middle East, say, or from Asia and the Pacific. They can be international and connected in with the international system or transnational, connecting across all of our borders. They may even be a mixture of these. And um, some years ago, I think uh, I was asked to contribute to a book called The Third Force. And it was uh, taking this phrase, the third force, from one of the UN Secretary Generals who described civil society as the third force after governments and I can't remember what the second was meant to be, maybe military, I don't know. But anyway, civil society was as the third force. And, um, and so, uh, it, you know, this book, which is on your reading list, was looking at different kinds of ways of transnational mobilization on a range of peace and justice uh, issues, uh, also trade in fact, also you know, economic justice as well as, as, as um, other kinds of you know, human rights and disarmament, these issues. Um, but 
it, we are much more than NGOs. You know, the people's movements are much more than NGOs. The people's movements, and I think of as also the civil society, and in fact, many of us prefer to refer to uh, civil society um, because uh, there's also that be belief in civil society as having progressive intention, very much connected with nonviolent ways of effecting change. Whereas NGOs is a category that under the UN, United Nations and is not necessarily progressive, not necessarily nonviolent. For example, the US National Rifle Association that promotes guns and gun use and gun sales is an NGO. And when during all those times when there were the um, the uh, building of the bans on landmines and cluster munitions and then the building of control arms and the international action network on small arms, I answer, uh, these, uh, you know, these would go to the UN to try to control arms and get a program of action to control arms and the National Rifle Association would demand equal time to speak as an NGO and they they received it because they are an NGO. So <clears throat> civil society is much more than NGOs. NGOs are a subset, one can say, but also there is, is kind of not a completely, it's not completely a subset. So civil society, I think, has much more this connotation of being progressive and using non-violent means and these can be grassroots and they can be community-based uh, you can have these civil society organizations um, you know for 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 locally based issues to to you know to build a school or to uh, get clean water or to um, you know it can be for all sorts of, of different things they can also be at the other end, uh, think tanks and academic institutions. And they can be political or religiously constituted or based on identities. You can have women's organizations or particular ethnic groups, um, you know, uh, civil society against racism. Uh, you can also have uh, cross religious groups like. Um, you know, uh, re religious, uh, the World I, I Council on Religions, these sorts of things, or you can have um, cross-political, you can have issue-based. When we think of civil society, we often think of issues that can be for or against. You can have issue-based mobilizations that are for the earth for the protection of our village, or our towns, or our homes, or our country. You can have issue based for disarmament, for peace, for, just, for justice, for human rights, for democracy, for all sorts of issues along those kinds of lines, you know, issue based. And you can also have issue based civil society people's movements and groupings and mobilizations that are against certain things like, you know, movements against violence, movements against violence and rape, movements against, you know, sexual violence and, and uh, violence against women and children. Or you can have movements against your own government or movements against certain governments because of certain uh, activities. You can have movements against the pollution of our seas, movements against or to tackle climate change, movements to reduce and eliminate certain kinds of weapons or reduce the use or the production of fossil fuels and eliminate their 
their use. You can have movements against big agribusiness, movements against big pharmaceutical companies or these sorts of things, or movements against war and militarism. So all of these are part of civil society in different ways. And many of us are not just part of one, we're actually part of a spectrum of, of different kinds of, of civil society groupings or networks. So just in my own life, uh, it feels like quite a long life these days, I've been part of different kinds of people's movements and different kinds of, of uh, resistance. And I'm just going to name a number of them going sort of back to when I was at university and I was very much part of a, I, I helped to found the Women's Liberation Group at um, uh, Bristol University because this was 1973, 74, and I joined the socialist group uh, because I, you know, I, I wanted to learn more about this. I was also part of a street theatre group where we, I would write songs uh, and we would take it out onto the streets about, you know, women's liberation and women's rights and also gay rights and also for the Chilean refugees uh, that had come to Bristol after the terrible coup in Chile because this was that time as well. We had street theatre to with them um, uh, so that the people of Bristol could see why it was so important for us to include them in our community and support them and help them and have solidarity. And we, the street theatre did songs and, 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 and talks about, you know, to raise money for, ho for, the, for the homeless people in Bristol. So that's another kind of civil society. And then when I moved to Japan from 1970 to 1981, I became part of a circle of Japanese feminists, Japanese and Korean feminists uh, in Tokyo. And uh, this was a group that exchanged information and taught me Japanese. I was also teaching them some English, but sharing our lives and our experiences. Uh, we were, in a sense, a women's liberation reading group. Uh, we met at each other's houses and shared food and shared ideas, but also this group was building um, resources to be able to set up a rape crisis center in Tokyo, which indeed this is exactly what they did some years, a few years after I left in 1981 and, uh, and went back to London and then got involved with my next part of civil society um, uh, which was Greenham Common Women's Peace Camp. This was never instituted as an organization. It was very organic. It started as a march of a group of women wanting to, going to the first base in, in Europe, in fact, that was earmarked to have this new generation of nuclear cruise missiles uh, through NATO. It didn't set up as a peace camp at all. That was almost an accident. The women chained themselves to the fence and then it started raining. So local people brought tents and suddenly we had a peace camp. And then there were peace camps all over in all kinds of countries, in the United States and in, in Japan. Actually, there had been a peace camp in Japan even before us that we didn't know about. Um, there, um, you know, all over Europe and so on. So this was another kind of very organic civil society, very anarchistic feminist peace uh, movement that really developed other, you know, in, um, some of the um, understandings of feminism that we've now shared and have been taken up by other environmental movements and the Occupy movement and so on. And then when I left Green, um, Greenham, I was actually hired by a civil society group that was also an NGO, Greenpeace. The name is there, you know, Ecology and Peace. And this was a transnational NGO and it networked with a lot of anti-nuclear groups, some official, some non, like the Nevada Semi-Palatinsk movement in Kazakhstan and, and the anti, uh, the, the, the peace test, the American peace test groups and the women, you know, the, the nuclear free independent Pacific groups, the at the uh, groups opposing nuclear testing all around the world, the Japanese Hibakusha and 
you know, anti-nuclear energy, all of these sorts of groups, and also the Western Shoshone, and then a group of, of NGOs that, of which I was also a part, which were like little think tanks, set up something that we actually called TBAG, which was the Test Ban Action Group, specifically to get a ban on nuclear testing. And then there was the organization that predated us on nuclear issues in the UK, Campaign for Nuclear Disarmament. I didn't join them until quite a long way into my time at Greenham Common, but they were the big organization on um, nuclear issues. And then, and as part of CND, and somebody had asked this question yesterday, what were the connections between C and D and anti-apartheid? And these connections were kind of around uranium mining, but also around liberation, around anti-racism, which of course anti-apartheid was specifically about opposing the institutions of racism in South Africa. So there were a lot of those kinds of connections. And with much older peace groups like Women's International League for Peace and Freedom, WILF that I've mentioned, International Peace Bureau, IPPNW, the Doctors' Organization and Network, again an NGO from the 1980s. So all of these were connecting up in that time and connected up in my life. Then I got involved with Women in Black, which had started in Jerusalem, opposing the occupation of Palestinian lands by Israel, but spread into opposing violence opposing war, was picked up by women in uh, Serbia and, and Croatia, and as the war divided Yugoslavia into uh, nationalist um, conflicting groups, and women in black became associated with the women there, trying to bring those war, warring parts of what had been Yugoslavia uh, opposing the war in different ways, opposing rape, which was used as a tool of war, insisting that rape be recognized as a war crime. So I got very involved with Women in Black, which itself was involved with Ruta Pacifica in Colombia and other organizations there that opposed war and militarism and terrorism and violence against women. And the Indian groups that were set up, the World Courts of Women, um, uh, Bangalore, Tunisia, you know, where these were all held. Uh, and in the early 1990s, I also set up the Acronym Institute to be a little think tank, to actually pay me a salary so that I could carry on doing all of this peace work I've been doing because I couldn't live on air. And I had left Greenpeace at that point because I needed to work against war and violence against women. And this, these were issues that although there were many supporters in Greenpeace, Greenpeace did not organizationally want to take these issues. And I understand this. This is why we have to understand civil society in these different ways. So I then uh, did... Uh, so I was then, I they, they then became an expert on treaties like the NPT and the CTBT and started to make my name as an academic uh, on these issues. And I even be became an academic again, at least as a student, to get my PhD while I was working full time in multilateral disarmament um, through treaty making uh, and looking particularly at the CTBT, which was actually my job to be, I, I'd made it my job, but to be that this. Um, but uh, in the mid uh, noughties, if you like, the mid 2000s, we had the war in Iraq. Of course, I had to be against war, against that particular war, in, you know. And, and then the anti nuclear movement, we then we decided that we couldn't rely, we couldn't just go through the UN. We didn't have disarmament, we only had arms control and non proliferation. So I went back to the grassroots. I moved to Scotland with a group of friends, lived two miles from the major nuclear submarine, nuclear armed submarines base at Faslane in Scotland to oppose the next generation of British nuclear weapons. And we built a movement called Faslane 365. 
365 because we intended to blockade or what you might say and call in Hong Kong besiege, you know, to blockade this nuclear base for every day of a whole year if we could. And we mobilized communities, villages from Scotland and England and Wales and, and you know, Hibakusha from Hiroshima and Nagasaki and groups of doctors and groups of teachers and groups of lawyers and uh, groups from all over the world, academics, teachers and students blockaded together. The, the, the professors held teach-ins in, for two days in front of, of the, the, the gates of, of the uh, Faslane nuclear base with students locked on to each other. This was just amazing. And during that time, I also was carrying on with my paid job, my institute job, producing our journal, communication, writing. It's all part of civil society and movement building. I was invited to be uh, on the board of the Bulletin of the Atomic Scientists that is responsible for the Doomsday Clock because my origins, I was originally trained as a scientist. Uh, I was invited onto the International Panel of, on Fissile Materials, which I still serve on, the IPFM that I've been talking about a bit uh, in past lectures. Uh, million Women Rise, that I'm even wearing the t-shirt of, um, as an example, I really, I must stand up or the microphone will get um, come off, which was organized by uh, women from the, the, the black and um, uh, an Asian minority communities in the UK. It, uh, it, 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 Million Women Rise is for, for all women, was started in the UK, but they wanted, but it, we already had Reclaim the Night, but Reclaim the Night was still very dominated by white, you know, British women and the, the Asian and the Caribbean women who are such a strong part of, of Britain and have been for uh, many years, they wanted to do something a bit different and they built this Million Women Rise and I became part of that uh, with, uh, with the, the demonstrations, but not leadership of that. The leadership was for the black and, and Asian women. They chose the messaging and my partner and I supported as stewards of the marches on, the, on March 8th of International Women's Day or the nearest Saturday. We went right through central London uh, and we've been doing that for uh, 12, I think this year was the 12th year. And then Women Cross DMZ was another part of civil society that I've mentioned here already. This is where I met Jade and Kinchi last year uh, with, with women from uh, Korea, but also from international solidarity groups. I'm wearing the scarf of, of Women Cross DMZ um, and their campaign for peace treaty, for denuclearization, for reconciliation for the people of Korea to choose their own future together. And then finally, when Extinction Rebellion, the big, the, the grassroots climate resistance uh, started in, in the UK, I felt I had to become part of that. So you can see from all of these different kinds of organizations, civil society is many things. And we ourselves can connect with many parts of that in our lives, sequentially or um, at the same time, we can be part of these different movements as they come together. So that is where I'm now gonna stop and hand over to our next examples of civil society organization. And this is from Hiroko-san and Emiko-san, who you heard about, who you heard from yesterday, talking specifically about the Fukushima issue. And we've now invited them to talk more about their own experiences of resisting and mobilizing on these issues. Thank you very much.